homestead in Hertfordshire is a good place to start thinking about the Norman Conquest. It was here that William received the final surrender after Hastings. So the chief men who'd survived and the Londoners did their best. They rallied round the young Prince Edgar, great nephew of Edward Confessor, but nothing came of it. William had the armed might and it was here they surrendered. Now, there's another reason too why Barkhamstead is a good place. Barkhamstead is an almost perfect symbol of Norman success, military might, domination, government skill. And if we look round, we can see why. William gave this manor of Barkhamstead to his half-brother, Robert, Count of Mortain. And it was here that Robert built what we can call almost a typical mot. If we look in that direction, we can see a mot, an earthwork, 45 feet high, a very substantial work with, originally, a wooden building on top. You can see even now, to this day, the well which was used to service the garrison that established itself there. And he built also a great bailey, an enclosure, that was improved on as the generations passed, so that by the end of the 12th century, it was one of the great works of the kingdom. A mot and a bailey with water defences, a moat to protect it, a symbol of, as we say, Norman success and military power. And by 1150, England was littered with such fortifications. Now, why the Normans? It is amazing how much national feeling there still is about this Norman conquest. Go into Sussex and you're asked, why is it that our men failed at Hastings? And it's the same the other side of the channel. Napoleon himself, when he was thinking of invading England, hauled the Bayer tapestry out from Bayer into Paris to show it on exhibition to encourage his people in his planned invasion. But it's a Norman conquest we think of, not a French conquest. There were plenty of non-Norman Frenchmen in William's army, but the direction was Norman. The heart of the enterprise was Norman. And the reason for this is really quite simple. The strongest men in 11th century France were not the kings, but the great princes. And William, by the middle of the 11th century, was the most powerful of those great princes. The Normans, in origin, yes, they were Vikings. The Norman dukes descended from Viking adventurers who'd carved out a principality for themselves in North France. But by 1066, William, in his prime, 38 years of age, was the strongest among the French feudal princes of the North. And the emphasis is on the Frenchness and also on the feudal nature of his power. Knights on horseback, castles. That is the secret of William's strength. But William had come up the hard way in this feudal world. To begin with, he was notoriously illegitimate. And his father had died when he was only eight, and it was touch and go whether or not he succeeded to the duchy. It was the loyalty and courage of his immediate companions that really maintained his position for him. By 1047, he was reasonably secure, though even in the 1050s, he still had to show his prowess as a fighting man, even against his own overlord, the King of France. 1060, the French King Henry I died and was succeeded by his young son. This brought enormous advantage to William. The guardian of the young son was the Count of Flanders, who was William's own father-in-law. His position now was so much more secure diplomatically, 
as well as militarily, in the north of France. But the duchy that he ruled was still turbulent enough. Some of the more turbulent spirits, it's true, it was something to do, I think, with Norman enterprise in this particular generation, had already hived off to Italy, where they were making a reputation for themselves in Apulia and the south of the peninsula. Now came William's real opportunity. And we must remember that the English venture itself served in a way to canalize the turbulence of this North French duchy, and indeed in some measure to help give an outlet for this feudal energy for the whole of France. And England was a tempting prize, wealthy and prosperous. It had enjoyed roughly half a century of relative peace, first under the Danish conqueror, Canute, 1016 to 35, and then under Edward Confessor, 1042 to 66, representative of the old ruling dynasty of England. But the succession was uncertain. Edward had no children. He brought his nephew back, it's true, from Hungary in 1057, Edward the Atheling, but the Anglo-Saxon chronicler comments very grimly that he was not suffered to look on the face of his kinsman. Edward died soon after his arrival in England, leaving three young children, but of course, in 1066, that was not good enough. The country needed, above all, at that stage, a strong man. Threats to England came in particular from two directions. The Scandinavian kings had an interest. The Danish king as the heir of Canute, but probably more ominous in the politics of the 1060s, the Norwegian king also had a right by terms of a treaty made as far back as the 1040s. And this Norwegian king was one of the giant figures of the age, Harald Hadrada, former captain in the Varangian Guard at Constantinople, king of Norway since 1047, bigger than life, physically and politically, and the threat from Hardrada must have been very present in English minds in 1066. Fortunately, from their point of view, they must have seen a strong man available and at hand. England had its strong man in Harold, son of Godwin, King Edward's brother-in-law. Harold was the chief representative of the great house of Godwin, immensely wealthy and influential. He'd made, on his own behalf, a great reputation as a soldier and a statesman, particularly in his Welsh campaigns in the late 50s and early 60s. If William was the strongest man in North France, Harold was undoubtedly the strongest man in England. And so, quite sensibly, and formally and legally, the Witton, after King Edward's death in the first week of January 1066, elected Harold as King of England, King Harold II. The chronicler added rather ominously, he had little peace in it. And so it turned out. Now, the other side of the channel, William heard this news and immediately acted. Why should he have an interest at all, one might ask? And the answer at first sight is a little bit obscure. Certainly, there was no claim by blood to the throne of England. The most that the Norman apologists could find to say for William when they considered his birth was that his great aunt, 
was King Edward's mother, which was pretty obscure and distant. But in other ways, he had a case. And in the first six months of 1066, he made that case energetically throughout the courts of Europe. It rested essentially on two planks. First, that King Edward, who was admittedly his distant kinsman, had himself promised, probably in 1051 or 52, that William would be allowed a say in the succession. And secondly, and this perhaps was the more important of the two, that Harold, on a trip to Normandy in 1064, had acquiesced in this and had agreed to fight on William's behalf for the succession. So the Norman case could portray Harold as an oath-breaker and a usurper. And sure enough, they made full use of the elements of strength in that case. At the papal court, at the court of the emperor, the Danish king seems also to have agreed to at least uh, not uh, himself contend for the throne at the time. And William, by the summer of 1066, must have felt that he'd cleared the diplomatic air pretty thoroughly. So, using what now seemed to be strong support from the papacy especially, he recruited far and wide, but especially, of course, among his own Norman nobles. By August, he was ready. The army was stationed along the Norman coast, waiting for a favorable wind, but that wind did not come. Mid-September, Harold must have thought the worst was over. It was getting late in the campaigning season. But now the first of the blows fell from the north. Harold Hardrada invaded with 300 ships into the Tyne, joined there by Tosti and forces from Scotland, and then they sailed south, up the Yorkshire Ouse to Rickle, 10 miles from York. Now, the northern earls were there, ready for them, Edwin and Morka, and they fulfilled their task admirably. There was a hard-fought battle on September the 20th at Gate Fulford, just south of York. The English were defeated, and the Norwegians made their way into York itself. Now came, so Hadrada must have felt, the moment of triumph. He savoured his victory, but not for long. He withdrew to the royal manor of Aldby, east of York and waited for hostages to come in from all of Yorkshire. Instead, he had the surprise of his life. It was now that Harold Godwinson showed his true mettle as a commander. He marched north in one of the most famous forced marches of English history. He reached Tadcaster on September the 24th. On the 25th, he was through York and at the Norwegians at Stamford Bridge itself. The Norwegians, taken by surprise, were defeated, but only after a very hard-fought battle indeed. Hadrada was killed, so too was Tosti. Harold showed himself generous to the survivors. Prince Olaf, the Earl of Orkney and their bishop, made their way back to their ships, 25 ships enough to take the survivors away, and Harold withdrew to York to savour his victory. Meanwhile, bad news now came from the south. The wind which had pinned the Normans down in their ports across the channel now turned in their favour. The Norman fleet set sail and they landed here at Pevensey and unloaded 
their arms, their equipment, their men, their horses. They then moved east to Hastings and they set up there what was to be the permanent base for the expedition, establishing a fortification, a secure place from which they could operate at will. It's a windy day here at Battle, very much as it might have been in October 1066. Harold was now in a dilemma. He'd marched south to London, and that was fine. And all the armchair critics now say he should have stayed put and waited until his armies came to him. One of our authorities actually says that the army was ill-equipped and unready for action when it moved south. But move south he did, and one can see the reasons why. This was his favorite patch of country that was being threatened. And remember, he'd been enormously successful up in the north by swift action, action that took the enemy completely by surprise. So south he went, south towards Hastings. And it was here on the ridge, Senlac, Tellum Hill, the ridge that ever after was to be known as battle, that he drew up his positions. That was on the Friday, Friday, October the 13th. Well, now we come to the real crisis. There was William at Hastings. What was he to do? Similar advice to that which surely had been given to Harold in London was now given to him. There were some who said, stay put and wait for the attack. But it was here that William showed his audacity and courage as a commander. He decided to move north to battle. And on the Saturday, October the 14th, Harold discovered in front of him, strewn out on that countryside there, the Norman army ready to attack. From that moment onwards, the battle depended on initiative, and on mobility. And William, in one sense, had won the battle by making that decision right at the outset. So there they were, the Normans in the center, to the left, the French and the Flemish, to the right, the Bretons, and the attack was launched. Our best guide is undoubtedly for this, the Bayer Tapestry. The designer of the tapestry, a very intelligent man, drew on current ideas about the battle and put them together in a magnificently organized fashion. And what he tells us is roughly this, that mobility gave success to William, but only after tremendous effort. The first cavalry charge, which he shows in a most graphic and imaginative way failed and the Normans were hurled back. But then afterwards there occurred incidents which remained riveted in men's imaginations, incidents that were obviously, with hindsight, decisive. First, and quite early in the battle, Harold's two brothers were killed, the two earls, Gerth and Leofwina. And then, shortly after, the English, possibly overconfident, remember where they were, 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 they were drawn up on this ridge with the good phalanx of foot soldiers, the shield wall there resisting attack, possibly overconfident, some of them moved down and were cut off on a little hillock, probably the little hillock that lies there to our right. After that, it was still a hard slog, but the final step was taken when William, disclaiming all thought of injury and of harm, three horses, remember, had been shot under him, attacked and led the last fine cavalry charge against the shield wall here, precisely near the spot where we're standing. And this time, it was Norman success. The Normans broke through. Harold himself, 
almost certainly struck in the eye with an arrow was cut down by the Norman vanguard led by William, by Eustace Boulogne and by others and fell here at the very spot where the high altar of Battle Abbey was afterwards erected. The English had lost the day. We can feel the sense of melancholy and disaster in the words of the chronicler as he tells us the French remained masters of the field. The English had lost because, says the chronicler, because of the sins of the people. And now, to summarise the programme, the Normans were triumphant. They claimed afterwards that all England was won in one battle, the Battle of Hastings, and in a measure this was correct. To begin with, they tried to govern the country with the help of the surviving great men, Edwin, Morker, Stigand and company, but this did not last. Pro rebellion or provoked rebellion broke out in the west at Exeter, along the Welsh marches, in the Fenlands, Hereward the Wake, and above all, in Northumbria. The decisive years were 1069 to 71. William advanced north, devastated York and the, much of the Northumbrian earldom in a savage winter campaign. He showed his mettle as a ruler, but also his ferocity. And ever after, this campaign was known as the harrying of the North. Mercia and much of Northumbria for the rest of his reign were quiet. By 1072, it was all over. The conquest was complete. Now for the settlement. And here we come to a very tangled story. Remember that William claimed to be the legal heir of Edward the Confessor, but he was also a conqueror, and those two interwoven threads of legality and force of conquest run right through the reign. Legality and maintenance of the old, yes. Shire courts, hundred courts, the coinage, the mechanics of government that had been brought to a fine pitch in late Anglo-Saxon England. But there was much also that was new. It was, in a sense, a feudal settlement. And the ideas of very closely integrated land tenure and military service and the institutions, castles, knights on horseback, were introduced from the continent. So we have, in William's England, the combination of both the old and the new. And for once, the historian is well placed. Towards the end of his reign, William ordered a great survey to be made, a survey the results of which are embodied in the record that we now know as Doomsday Book. Doomsday Book gives us a picture of a real tenurial revolution in England. By 1086, not much more than 4% of the land remained under English control. Instead, the Normans and the French and the Bretons shared out the bulk of the landed wealth of England. There were perhaps 180 men who owned estates that brought them revenue of £100 a year, a great sum in those days, and gave them what we now tend to call baronial rank. And within that group, we see a smaller, tighter-knit group again of 10 or 12 men concentrating the wealth of England. The king himself kept about a seventh in his own hands. Look at this entry for Sussex. Land of the king. King William holds in his lordship Bosom. Earl Godwin held it. So, tenurial revolution and the introduction too of a new aristocracy. Lower down, it's harder to say, the peasantry carried on very much as they had before, as a peasantry always does. 
but the hand of their new masters was stronger and firmer and manorial discipline was tighter. Gradually, the great range of peasants that we find in Anglo-Saxon England, from free peasants right down to slaves, disappeared and was assimilated into a uniform villainage. The general effects, well, dramatic and indeed traumatic for many. The aristocracy displaced. The court, the king and all surrounding him, more divorced from those who were ruled. The language changed at least at the top level so that Norman French became the tongue of polite society. And England itself brought more firmly into contact with the continent. Something, in a way, of an element of colonization about it, not a colonization by peasants. The Normans did not get their hands dirty, but merchants moved in as the urban classes flourished under the new regime. Overall, well, as always, a balance. Perhaps the best word was spoken by a man many regard as the greatest of the 12th century historians, William of Malmesbury, part Norman himself, part English. The Normans, he said, plundered their subjects, but they protected them from others. <laughs>